Okay. Well, why don't we get started? Because what I'm going to say, most of you heard in the poster anyway. Um, <laughs> and the really interesting part, I think, for this is, is learning a little bit more about the connections between sun and stars. Um, a lot of folks in coffees are working on that. And so we just chose two of the people who have um, given us good talks recently um, to give us another one. And we thought we'd share it. And because it was the AAS, we thought it would be a nice chance to sort of make a bridge to some of the other folks who are interested in cycles, but not necessarily the, only the sun's cycle. So I'll just give you a brief overview of the coffees project, uh, and then we'll get to the interesting science part. I'm not gonna show any pretty pictures. I'm gonna leave all those to the other speakers. So I'm just gonna give you a few words. So consequences of fields and flows in the interior and exterior of the sun, we have to define it once, but from here on in, we'll just call it coffees, um, is really trying to understand what's going on inside the sun uh, why is there a solar cycle? Uh, what's the next one going to be like? And so our, our, the sort of big picture view of our vision is to develop a data-driven model of solar activity such that accurate measurements, not just uh, made up stuff, but accurate measurements of 3D plasma flows in the sun can drive a reliable physical model of the solar activity cycle with an emphasis there on reliable and physical because there are lots of models of solar activity, but none of them are reliable and physical enough. Um, and then, of course, the consequent magnetic field evolution that we see on the surface of the sun. So it's a fairly big goal, um, but that's what we want to do. Um, and then we sort of added this text in white because it's not just about the science. It's also about building a center. And so we also want to create a diverse and inclusive center of excellence in solar physics that will expand our understanding of the sun and the ability to predict the solar activity cycle and magnetic field evolution. So it's not totally independent. But it's a little bit different emphasis, it's not just the science, it's also about getting people together um, and finding ways to collaborate with people who aren't the people that you usually collaborate with. So what is a drive science center? Um, well, we're really sort of deciding what that is sort of by making a proposal. Um, the heliophysics in the last um, decadal survey identified that we should identify these grand challenge goals that are both ambitious and focused enough to be achievable within a five-year lifetime of a center. Um, and so that's really what it is. It's a chance to get together uh, with a number of other people, not just in a sort of typical research grant or even just a couple people working together on some kind of focus science topic, but to actually create a center where you can solve a bigger problem that you can't solve in some other way. Uh, and that's really what we're doing. And so what we're trying to do now is um, come up with the, our five-year proposal uh, we've had two years to sort of get started. Uh, we're about a year into that two-year process, and now we're writing the proposal for five years that we think we can actually accomplish what we've set out for ourselves. So our strategic plan um, has lots of elements to it, but one of the things to think about is what is the breakthrough science? And so what we want to do is we want to understand the interior flow fields uh, of the sun with the helioseismology, but also with the models. Um, and how they generate and interact with the magnetic fields in the interior, um, and how all that ties together to lead to a solar cycle or a stellar cycle, as we're going to find out today. Um, what we can see, of course, is only what we can see at the surface with sunspots and magnetic fields. And so how do we link those two things together so that we can understand more about the interior from what we can see on the exterior? Um, and what from the exterior, are there any constraints that we can place on the models that are inside? So what we'd like to be able to forecast is not just the magnitude of the next solar cycle, but also perhaps give some idea of where new active regions are going to come up. Um, so we're not going to predict an individual sunspot region, but we would like to be able to say, well, there's a nest of activity here, and this is a longitude where things are going to happen. So we've identified for ourselves sort of five top level science questions, um, and these things bring together all the different groups that are working together. Um, we've set up a set of teams, and I'll talk about those in a few minutes, but there are five questions that we want to emphasize. The first is what drives large-scale motions, such as meridional flow and differential rotation. And then the other, sort of flip side of that is how do those flows interact with magnetic fields to create varying activity cycles? So this is sort of a cause and effect kind of question of the large-scale flow. So things like differential rotation and meridional flow and torsional oscillations and convection. So what are all those things and how do they tie together and create a cycle? 
Uh, then uh, a little bit more practical, so questions three and four are also sort of two sides of a coin. What causes active regions to emerge when and where they do during the solar cycle? Why do they emerge at high latitudes? Why do they observe at some longitudes rather than others? And then conversely, how do the observed manifestations of activity and convection reflect and constrain those internal processes? So how does what we see at the surface tell us about what's happening deep inside, not just through the helioseismology, but also in terms of the models? And then, of course, you know, how does the study of the sun as a star inform us more generally uh, about activity, dynamics, and structure? So we can only see one example of a solar cycle on the sun, um, but we can see many examples on other stars, and those other stars have different conditions, and we're going to hear a little bit more about that later. So we can also sort of come at it from a different direction. Instead of just the science questions, it's what are our science goals? And these are oriented a little bit more toward the teams that we're going to talk about. Um, one is, the first is to understand how the sun and stars generate magnetic cycles at all. And this is really sort of focused on the dynamo. Uh, the second is to advance fully 3D physical models of solar and stellar interior dynamics convection. This is our convection team. The third is to establish the physical links between flows and fields and evolving near surface observations. And that's what we call our surface links team. And we're trying to understand those connections between the inside and the outside. And then perhaps out of order, develop robust helioseismic techniques to confidently resolve solar interior flows. There's a lot of, been a lot of progress in understanding what's actually happening inside the sun, um, but there's still a lot of uncertainties in terms of how much can you trust the observations, how deep can you push them, and how can you relate them to the solar activity cycles of the dynamos. But then we also have some broader goals, um, and that's to involve students, uh, science and technology, engineering and medicine students, um, and the public and the excitement of what we're doing and of heliophysics in general. And so we have another team that's set up to, to look at that. Um, we want to advance diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, and that's DIA in the, in the jargon of the day, um, in the coffees in the heliophysics community. So we've got a, a definite outreach there to, to find ways to include more people and to um, provide opportunities. And then we'd like to, after the five years, leave an enduring legacy in heliophysics by mentoring the students and postdocs and early career scientists, and maybe even some of us old people um, as well. So the coffee's teams are, um, the primary ones are dynamo, convection, helium seismology, and surface links. And those are tied to those goals that I just talked about. And the figure just gives you sort of a, an idea of how those different things connect to each other. So for example, um, a dynamo simulation is shown up on the upper left, you know, takes inputs from the, sign, the surface characteristics as well as the modeling team uh, to provide constraints. And that then simulates a magnetic field in the interior, and that provides uh, another input to the magnetic flux rising the emergence simulation. And that again, in turn, takes uh, constraints and inputs from physical convictions in the convection zone and so on around the circle. I don't wanna go into too much detail here. Um, but we have these different teams and, and typically people are members of more than one team. Um, and each team has a number of working groups uh, that are focused on specific aspects of these. So this is the uh, sort of outline of what the Dynamo team is currently working on. Um, so there are three working groups right now, uh, one for Dynamo modeling, and I think that will probably continue throughout the life of the center. Uh, one on emerging flux, and you'll notice that that occurs as a common theme. There are actually a couple other groups that we're trying to merge together from um, other teams. Um, and comparison of dynamo models with observations. And again, that's forming the links with others. Um, as we go forward in the next five years, I think the working groups will you know, sort of reform as things get finished and we'll form new ones as we see new opportunities or as we decide to merge things that we've already been working on. So that's the dynamo team. Um, the convection team uh, is looking at tachocline dynamics. The tachocline is the region at the bottom of the solar convection zone, about a third of the way inside the sun where there's a difference in the rotation rate between the layer just above and just below. The layer below is static, rotates at the same rate everywhere, and the one above doesn't. And so you wind up with a lot of uh, interesting features happening there. And that's perhaps the site of the dynamo or a lot of the dynamo action. Um, then working group two is magnetic flux structure and creation. And, th and then there's some ideas about other kinds of mechanisms for solar dynamos or stellar dynamos uh, that might come up. The helioseismology team, um, is looking at uh, finding consistent uh, results from different kinds of methods. Right now, they sort of agree, but they sort of don't. Some people see multiple cycles, some people multiple 
um, meridional flow patterns and some of them don't. Um, and that ties into group four with the systematic effects. And then there's the differential rotation and the sound speed variations in the inside. And how do those relate to and help you understand what a dynamo might have to deal with in terms of the large structure. Um, and then the surface lengths team, you know, has uh, five different uh, large scale working groups. One of them looking at active region properties like where they emerge. Uh, one of them looking at surface flows where we try to understand, you know, what can we see at the surface and how does that tie into what we see just below the surface in terms of the flows in the meridional direction, north and south, um, and why are there changes in the differential rotation from one place to another, this, the torsional oscillation. A uh, third one is the polar field origins. That's basically how flux gets from low latitudes to high latitudes or where the flux emerges in active regions and how it moves forward, And is that the whole story or is there something else going on? Uh, group four is the near surface flux emergence. And that's really a question of how do you get flux that's inside the sun and been trapped forever or for a long time anyway, um, to actually get to the surface and then come out the way we see it. And so understanding that connection between the deep interior and the surface is, is something that you can model. Um, and then looking at helicity, which is basically the twist in the magnetic field and that tells you a lot about how the field is, is um, generated deeper down. Um, and then we have a modeling team, which is kind of cross, uh, cross disciplinary. And it really helps people who are doing simulations and models to couple their codes. Um, so there's sort of the modeling technology aspect. Um, there are machine learning experts in the group uh, and they're looking at different specific things, but also then trying to teach the rest of the coffee's members what's going on. And then the question is, you know, how do you share this data that you generate, either whether it's observational data or whether it's data from a model or whether it's somebody else's data. Um, and so we're working on um, ways to, to be able to share and, and provide um, access to data from a bunch, a bunch of different teams. So that's all I had. Um, I'll stop sharing and see if there's any questions at this point. Just a quick overview of, of kind of where we are and what we're interested in doing. Looks deadly silent. Either that or I've been muted the whole time and no one's heard anything. <laughs> I do see a question in the oh, chat. Is there a research group dedicated to the solar corona? No, you know, and that's, a, that's kind of unfortunate. You know, when we emerge flux from the interior, of course it has to emerge through the photosphere into the corona. But what we did is we decided that we had to stop someplace. And originally we were gonna go into the corona and we just decided that given the resources that we're gonna have and the number of people involved, we sort of had to draw a line someplace. And so we drew it at, on, the, on the exterior of the sun, not exterior to the sun. And that's, that's how the E got in coffees. <laughs> Alfio, did you add a question? Alfio? Okay. Uh, well, just I want I want just to, to stress that coronal fields are essential for the uh, uh, for the boundary for the dynamo. So even there is not um, a group for the coronal field, it's extremely important to have a, a proper boundary condition for the dynamo. So. Yeah, it will not be so uh, say so sharp in designing uh, that is interior and outside. This is really a, a general uh, problem in the community. That I, I I will try that. I mean, this is a really an occasion to to make this this, this uh, let's say this boundary smoother instead of uh, having a sharp uh, uh, boundary. I don't know what you think about that. Well, I think you're exactly right, Alfio. I think, and I think it's a really good point. You know, you can't isolate one part of the sun and study it apart from all of the others. Um, and you know, particularly when you get to flux emergence, what happens in the corona really has a lot to do with how flux emerges. Um, and you know, I think also can can illustrate or you know, illuminate you know some of the things that we haven't seen. You know, I think the first way we ever saw the extended solar cycle was by looking at atmospheric signals, for example. And so, you know, you can see structures and things in the corona that are, that are um, very important for understanding these large scale uh, flows and the large scale patterns and the emergence of flux. So I think, I think it is really critical. 
I guess the point was not that we're, we're not interested in it, but you know, our focus is going to be surface and interior rather than exterior because we can't do everything. You know, we'd like to go <laughs> to the bounds of the heliosphere and look at you know, how cosmic rays are affected, and, you know, but we're going to leave that a little bit aside for, for you know, at least for our main focus. Sasha, you have your hand raised. Yeah, Tota, uh, can you outline opportunities for students, undergraduate and graduate students in this project? Oh yeah, thank you, Sasha. That's a good point. So um, anybody who's interested is willing to be is is welcome to become an affiliate member of Coffees. That doesn't necessarily come with financial support, but we'd love to have you participate in the science and the working groups as as long as they're related to the Coffees events. Um, we also are setting up a mentoring program, uh, which Jason Jakovitz from the New Mexico State University is, is starting to pull together, um, where you can not just have your regular research mentor, which of course is your primary one, but if you find some people where you find somebody else in, within coffees who can provide some sort of advice or sort of, you know, some sort of, have some sort of commonality or bond with, you can generate that. So we're really looking to, to make that uh, opportunity available. We'll probably have some kind of postdoc program, um, and the folks who are funded in coffees will be able to support students at their local institutions as well. We may we'll certainly be running a summer program. We haven't quite defined the, the limits and boundaries of that yet, but we're gonna be working on that. Alan, did you have uh, something else that you wanted to ask or add? Yes, hi. hi. Yeah, thank you for answering my question regarding research on the solar corona. So I actually did work with Professor Jay Pasikoff from Williams College regarding mm -hmm. solar. Oh, maybe you know him. So, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. He's yeah, regarding guy. coronal heating. And then we're presenting a poster about that. And we usually go on these ex expeditions, these so total solar eclipse trips, and then we find out. And yeah, we have some interesting work. I think just getting some more data from the next eclipse, I think we're close to we think it's perhaps a breakthrough regarding this. So yeah, it would be great if we can collaborate with the rest of heliophysics and this really is interdisciplinary. So I'm wondering how we can be involved with farther research going forth with the rest of the groups. Uh, when is your, just a quick question first. What, what, when is your poster, Alan? Yeah, it is tomorrow. It's okay. some time between five and 5.30. Okay, what's the session number? Do you remember? I can check. Um, put it in the, just put it in the chat. I think that'd be fine. Yeah, so I will check and put it in the chat. So yeah, okay. my professor. So, I, so obviously the, the structure of the corona is driven by the emergence or the, the magnetic field at the surface. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think, I think the close connection here between the surface and, and on the X side, uh, exterior side and the surface on the interior side um, are the, the implications of those structures. So for example, if you knew that there was a particular longitude uh, that was gonna be more active in one particular hemisphere, then that would be an interesting place to look for structures and to uh, try to understand how the corona is gonna evolve in response to it. And the helicity depends upon, will, will influence you know, how those features uh, escape from the sun, what the coronal mass ejection characteristics are like, uh, what the magnetic field structure might look like as it evolves, as it goes farther out toward the earth too. So there's some, some real interesting things I think there where we can look for commonalities. Yeah, and also I'm wondering what your area of focus is in heliophysics. So, so my, mine in particular is primarily on the magnetic field observations at the surface of the sun. Um, but I'm, I've always been very interested in the heliosphere. My, my research thesis uh, when I did my PhD was about the heliosphere and how you could determine what the heliospheric magnetic field structure was like based on the photospheric observation. So there's clearly a link there. All right, guys, yeah. I, I think we're, uh, we are running behind schedule. I'm sorry to cut you off, but please hang on till the end of the, the session. We'll have a Q&A session where we can dig into these uh, questions a little bit deeper. Uh, at this time, let's go ahead and move on to our guest speakers. Uh, our first guest speaker is Nick Featherstone, and he's going to be giving a talk on what kind of star is the sun. Nick, can you go ahead and share your screen, please? Yeah, it should be coming up. Give me one sec here. Great. I see your slideshows. Yeah, I wish I wish I knew there were going to be questions. I was desperately trying to grab a screenshot of Sasha Kosovichev's poster to put as my first slide. <laughs> so. 
just as a joke, for those of you who don't know, Todd's poster was <laughs> replaced with Sasha's in the, in the high poster session. Um, great. Uh, let me make sure I got the mouse right here because I'm driving on the laptop. Okay. We see, see your cursor. Yes. Awesome. Uh, great. Well, thank you. Uh, and um, yeah, so they asked me to speak a little bit uh, in this session. And so I'll just kind of, these are some musings of mine. Um, this work that I'm showing is really either done in direct collaboration or heavily influenced by these three people down here, Brad Heinemann, Keith Julian, and, and Jeff Vassell. Um, and so one sec, I see there's a slight delay. Okay. Yeah. So I guess um, what I want to do is just talk a little bit about, you know, you know, sort of the title, what kind of star is the sun? And by that, what I really mean is what sort of dynamical regime is the solar interior in? How is it acting? Is it acting like something that's in a rapidly rotating system, maybe because the convection is really slow, or is it acting like something that's in a, a more slowly rotating system um, because the convection is really fast? Um, and we know the rotation rate of the sun, but we don't have a good handle on the interior um, uh, convection. And so all of this was um, supposed to be kind of related, I, I think, to coffee science question five, which is, you know, how does considering the sun as a star inform us more generally about activity, uh, dynamics, and structure? And <clears throat> of course, you know, the nice thing about the sun is that we can see it in much more detail than we can any other star. Uh, and when we look at it, we see uh, quite a bit of, of magnetism um, all over its surface and magnetically uh, driven phenomena like flares and CMEs. Um, and then if we look at uh, look at these phenomena over time, uh, particularly with sunspots, of course, we know that the, the sun undergoes uh, magnetic polarity reversals uh, with a great deal of regularity. Uh, the sunspots uh, themselves exhibit a number of ordering rules and appear at certain latitudes uh, at certain times in the cycle. Um, and so, you know, all of this really begs the question, you know, where does all this magnetism come from and why is its behavior uh, so ordered uh, in space and time? Um, and so if we want to ask where the magnetism comes from, well, we know that the, the MHD approximation is a good approximation for the uh, bulk of the, the solar interior. And so we can look at the, the MHD equation um, and we say, well, if we want to understand B, um, what we really need is we need to understand V as well. Um, because V is what the velocity is what gives us uh, a shear. It's what moves the magnetic field around. Um, and then that can be a large scale shear like differential rotation, or it can be a, a small scale um, sort of alpha effect driven by helical convection. And one second, I'm turning off the chat. It's distracting me over here. Um, the problem, of course, is that in the solar interior, we, we don't have a good handle on V. We know the, the large scale uh, differential rotation very well. Um, and we know the meridional circulation um, to some extent pretty well. There's still some disagreement about what the, the cellular structure is at depth. Uh, but we really don't have a good handle on the convective flows. Um, and in particular, there are disagreements now um, between different helioseismic observations. And this is, this is an old figure, these two curves, the ring analysis curve and the time distance curve, which are both showing effectively the velocity power as a function of spatial scale. Um, those are a little closer together now, but they're still, they're still pretty, pretty further far apart. Um, and so even when we, when we probe deeply, we, we tend to get different answers. Um, but just looking at the photosphere uh, as well, there are some surprises. You know, if we look at a photospheric power spectrum, we have uh, a bump due to, to granulation, you know, predominantly radial uh, motion at disk center. Uh, and then we pick up quite a bit of uh, super granular signal, which is this sort of second bump at uh, spherical harmonic uh, degree 100. Um, but that's, there's a puzzle, like why, why is that a, a special uh, spatial scale? Um, and in particular, you know, from convection theory, we know that in, in convecting systems, um, we tend to create structures that are, whose spatial scale is on par with the, the depth of the layer. Um, and so one big question is, why don't we see giant cells or why are the, the giant cells that we seem to be seeing, which I'll touch on at the very end of this talk, uh, so weak? And those would be out here at L equals 10. And so 
there's disagreement in observations, and then there's there's some surprises from what we might expect um, from a theoretical perspective. Okay. <clears throat> um, and so we may uh, hang on a minute. I've got some weird Zoom stuff going on. There we go. Um, yeah, and so one way to get a handle on this is when we study the sun, and particularly as a, as a modeler, um, it's good not to have, you know, laser vision on the sun or what I think a solar model looks like. Um, and it helps, I think, to consider it within the context of the other stars, um, because um, stars, just like any other physical system, they really exhibit a range of behavior um, that varies across various different axes, right? Um, and so, of course, we we know, um, you know, there's this mass and luminosity relationship um, that we you know, like to illustrate through the, the HR diagram. We see correlations between the rotation rate of a star and its magnetic activity and its rotation rate with age. And so we might gain some insight by kind of asking where does the sun uh, lie along these axes? Um, and in looking and in asking that question, you know, can we identify some, some possible basins of behavior um, and then start to ask ourselves, you know, which of these, these buckets uh, does, the, does the sun possibly fit in? Okay. One sec, sorry. Long mess. There we go. Um, and so, you know, one of the, the interesting things is that we tend to think of stars as, as very different from planets. And they, they are, obviously, but there, there are some interesting similarities. And so, um, you know, most of the planets in the solar system um, harbor a magnetic field. The Earth has a magnetic field. It actually undergoes polarity uh, reversals, but they're, they're chaotic in time. Um, they, they, some of them last for a very long time. Others are, are pretty, pretty fast. Um, you know, Jupiter has a magnetic field. Saturn has a remarkably axisymmetric magnetic field, and that's, that's a little bit of a mystery. Um, but all of these things, stars and planets, uh, they can possess a region within their interior which is filled with some sort of a conducting fluid, and maybe that's liquid uh, iron, like in the Earth's core, or uh, an ionized plasma, like in a star. Um, and they have an interior source of heat, which is causing that fluid to convect, and they are rotating. And so when we step back and consider the sun as a rotating convecting system, um, a lot of the, the important information we, we care about has to do with ratios of different time scales. And some of those are, are very different uh, than what we might see in a planet, but others are not. And so, for instance, the, there's, there's this one number um, those of us in the field think about a lot, which is the Ekman number. And it's just the ratio of the rotation period to your viscous time scale. You know, how long does it take something to diffuse across the convective layer? And um, the Sun and the Earth are actually fairly similar. Um, different estimates give you something in around 10 to the minus 15. Um, the interesting thing is that when we model a star or a planet, we're trying to push to these kind of extreme ratios of, of time scales. Uh, simulations just can't get that far. And so if I'm modeling the Sun, in some respects, I'm also modeling the Earth and I'm also modeling Jupiter, and I'm doing a really terrible job uh, with all of those models. And so, you know, it, it behooves us, I think, to really explore the, the more general behavior uh, that's out there. And, you know, can we learn any lessons from studying other stars um, or uh, planetary dynamos? And sometimes this can yield some interesting results. And the one that I always tend to think about is this work uh, that Ben Brown did in his, his thesis. Um, and what he was doing was thinking about the solar dynamo, but he was really looking at uh, younger versions of the sun that spun faster than the sun does today. So he built what he thought was basically a solar dynamo model, but then spun it up. Um, and when he went through this exercise, what he found uh, was something kind of surprising, which was that in uh, a convecting system that had no tachycline, he could generate large scale uh, toroidal magnetic fields that were very organized, kind of like you're seeing here. So this is the, the um, magnetic field lines in one of his models from several years ago, colored by the, the polarity of the field. And this is very interesting. So this thing runs a dynamo and these can under, undergo cycles without any kind of interface mechanism, for instance, operating in the tachycline. 
And so you might ask, you know, do you, do you need an interface dynamo in the sun or possibly do you have something like our, our kind of canonical interface dynamo picture operating in tandem with something like this? Um, I don't know the answer to that, but this is just one example of kind of an interesting result that you can find when you, you sort of break away from the sun and think a little bit about the, the other stars in general. Um, so to me, one really interesting axis of behavior uh, or, or spectrum to look on is to say, you know, where, what, how does the convective structure um, that we might see um, find in the sun relate to its, uh, to the degree of rotational influence. Um, and you can think about that in terms of the Coriolis force, uh, which I've written here. And if you, if you look at that for just a second, you, you see that it looks a lot like QV cross B, right? But instead of a B, we've got an omega here. Um, and so with that, you can actually define uh, an analogous gyro radius, right? Um, so your flow is trying to move radially inward or outward. Um, and you're kind of forcing this particular scale in the flow uh, just by having a Coriolis force. And you can write that in terms of this non-dimensional number called the Rossby number, which is really just relating your rotation period to your overturning time. So if you have really fast convection, you have a really small overturning time and a really high Rossby number. Um, so what is kind of the effect of this? Well, when you're, when you're non-rotating, your convection is really just everywhere, right? It's all over the place and you tend to develop uh, a dominant scale of convection, which is, is on par with the depth of the convective layer. Oops, didn't mean to click that yet, but that's okay. Um, but as you rotate more rapidly or as your, your fluid speed decreases, um, you tend to start causing the fluid to align into uh, columnar structures. And as you rotate more rapidly, those structures become thinner and more vortical. And this is a, just a schematic. In fact, I've, one of the great pains of my life over the last year is I've realized that people see this and take this very literally. And so I just, I do want to point out that um, this, this is a cartoon up here, um, but you do see it in models in a much messier fashion. And so on the, on the bottom here, I've shown a progression from non-rotating to, to rapidly rotating convection. You're seeing radial velocity kind of near the, near the outer boundary. And the blue are downflows and the, the yellow red are upflows. And you see that the, as, you, as you move across the spectrum of rotational influence, uh, you do start to develop alignment in these structures uh, with the rotation axis. You can quantify that by taking, uh, taking spectra of these things. And you can at, you actually see in the spectra that as you change the degree of rotational influence, so as you make the Rossby number smaller, say, um, you develop a little peak and it starts to move to higher and higher wave numbers. Um, and you can say, okay, well, how does that peak scale with the rotation rate, right? How you know, quantitatively um, can we say anything about how these, these models um, behave in terms of the, the, the dominant convective structure and, and the Rossby number? And this is just a small sample of models from this larger survey that uh, Brad Hyman carried out last year. Next and, one more minute. One more minute, okay. Um, anyway, what you see is that these things uh, latch on to, to sort of a scaling and uh, that scaling actually tells us something about the force balance that's, that's at work in these. Um, I'm gonna kind of move ahead for one second. Magnetism doesn't seem to modify that very much. Um, and there's this really nice, nice paper um, written by, by Brad uh, where we identified several different uh, regimes of convection. And so I think one big question to start asking ourselves is, you know, where, where is the sun um, within some of these, these different regimes of rotating um, convection that we've identified? Um, these are some really laminar models, uh, not very high resolution. They just look good on a slide, but we have uh, some higher resolution movies I'll put this link into the chat after the talk, but you can actually see a nice uh, non-choppy version of these. Um, oops, one sec. Sorry. This one has uh, kind of a counter vortex at the poles. Um, and so what I'll just kind of say in the last, last second here um, is that a lot of these illustrate very, very interesting behavior. So when we, when we kind of look at the, the range of possible behaviors, we see quite a bit of, of activity going on uh, at the poles. 
And so it would be really nice if we, we had sort of an unobscured view of the polar regions. Um, from the ecliptic, we have a nice uh, view of kind of the, the, uh, the low latitudes. Uh, but this behavior that we're looking for, this sort of vortical motion uh, that's kind of occurring in a, in a plane parallel to the equatorial plane, it only, um, it, it, we don't see it very well in depth. And we, would, we could actually see all of that fully at the surface uh, if we had a polar vantage point. And so uh, the kind of the last slide there was just to say, we actually are seeing something from the ecliptic. There's two sets of very interesting results that show there are some coherent vortical structures appearing at the pole. Um, but when we try to observe those from this vantage point, uh, we, we run into some severe foreshortening effects and some resolution constraints. And so there, there's a mission that's in kind of this phase A study right now, uh, Solaris. And if it moves forward in 2029, we'll do a three month pass over each of the poles of the sun um, and have a, have a nice long observing period with a, basically an MDI-like uh, Doppler uh, magnetograph uh, to, to observe this. And I'll just uh, stop there. Sorry for going a little bit over time. Thanks so much, Nick. I want to make sure that uh, we have plenty of time for Travis to present. So I'm going to ask everyone to please hold your uh, questions until the end of uh, Travis's talk. Uh, Travis, if you want to go ahead and share your screen now. Thank you. Oops. Thanks, everyone, for sharing your coffee time with coffees, or if you're in my time zone, your lunch hour. Um, so uh, the question posed in my title is inspired by a science paper uh, published last year by Timo Reinhold and collaborators. Uh, and the answer depends a little bit on your definition of solar type stars, but it may also turn out to depend on uh, something more interesting that I'll get to uh, during the talk. Okay, so the Reinhold et al. work, um, basically tried to define a sample of stars uh, with characteristics similar to the sun in terms of say the surface temperature and composition uh, reasonably close in to the solar age uh, and also uh, when they could measure it uh, the rotation period um, and so they used the sample of stars observed by kepler the kepler space telescope uh, and in that sample, they could identify uh, a, small, a small sample of stars where, where the characteristics were close enough to solar to call them solar-like stars, and where they could also measure the rotation period. Uh, that represented about one-eighth of the, of the full sample. They then um, expanded the sample to include these pseudo-solar stars, which satisfied the same criteria for effective temperature, metallicity, uh, age, but where they could not detect rotation. And uh, if you observed the sun with the Kepler Space Telescope, you probably would not measure rotation either. So that's an interesting sample as well. Uh, and then what they looked at as an activity proxy for these stars was the um, range of stellar variability. So basically uh, how variable the stars were over time um, as you know, in percentage. Um, and they realized that because they had to cast kind of a broad net to define these solar type stars, where there's differences between temperatures and metallicities and rotation periods, um, they needed to correct for the fact that some of those stars had different properties. And so they did a, a linear regression model to try to tease out the uh, dependencies of the variability on those different properties, and then correct the variability for each of the stars to, to account for what they would look like if they were exactly had the solar properties. That's a little bit um, difficult because there are large uncertainties, for example, on the effective temperature and the metallicity. Um, and so it's an approximate correction. Um, notably, there was no correction for differences in the stellar age. I'll come back to that. So the end product of this, of this study is this distribution of uh, variability, uh, the degree of variability um, for these various samples. So the periodic stars where they could measure rotation periods is this dark blue histogram, relatively uncommon in the sample. And the composite sample that includes um, 
Also, these pseudo solar stars is represented by the, the dark um, histogram there. Uh, and the sun, if you um, degrade it, its observations to the sort of level of noise that you'd get from the Kepler Space Telescope, you get the histogram over on the left in light, light green or blue. So there's two possible interpretations of this um, histogram. Either this is a probability distribution of the range of rotation of uh, variability that any star like the sun potentially exhibits uh, at a given instant in time, or it represents um, some uncorrected age dependence where um, maybe the more active stars are also younger and the less active stars that are much more common and similar to the sun are um, much less active. So how can we tell the difference between these two possible interpretations? Let's dig down into their stellar samples and take a look. So if you just plot the uh, effective temperature versus the metallicity for their two samples, uh, you see that the periodic samples, so the ones where they could measure rotation, tend to be uh, cooler and slightly uh, more metal rich than average. And so the sun is represented by the star here. Uh, whereas the non-periodic stars where they can't measure rotation tend to be uh, hotter and, and metal poor. And both of these things, uh, produce opposite biases in the depth of the convective envelope. And that, I think you'll agree, is quite an important parameter for determining the stellar activity. So, so they're not comparing apples to apples here entirely in these two subsamples. Uh, and then if you look in more detail at the periodic sample, um, so where do you find, uh, where do you detect rotation? Uh, and the color code here is the range of variability, you see that compared to the sun, uh, stars with detected rotation tend to be more metal rich and cooler, so have lower Rossby numbers than the sun. And um, also the rotation periods that are detected tend to be faster on average than the sun. Um, now, again, this is exacerbated. The, the picture is a little bit blurry here because there are large uncertainties on the effective temperature and the metallicity, which they acknowledge in the, in the science paper. But the important uh, conclusion of these um, biases in the, in the stellar samples is that um, a scenario where that distribution of uh, variability is a probability distribution function, it's just like it, the sun could sometimes show five times more activity than it currently does, that would not be expected to have a, a dependence on the Rossby number, whereas an evolutionary scenario is very much expected to have a dependence on the Rossby number. Okay, and finally, just to hammer home the point that it is an evolutionary effect, um, if you look at, uh, so this is the Gaia absolute magnitude versus effective temperature of their sample. So the sun's over here, and again, the color code is the range of variability. So very highly variable stars over here, cooler than the sun and less luminous than the sun, which is, a, which is an indication that they're younger, right? Evolution makes stars brighter in an absolute sense over time. Um, and so you see the places where they actually detect larger variability compared to the sun are stars that are predominantly younger and in, in large part also cooler uh, with deeper convection zones. Okay, so the alternative interpretation that this is an evolutionary effect uh, totally jibes with um, evidence that has been accumulating over the last several years that somewhere around the middle of a star's main sequence lifetime, uh, rotation and activity actually decouple at a critical value of the Rossby number. And uh, that Rossby number is similar to the current solar value. And, and so the sun may actually be in this transition at the moment. So the interpretation of this distribution then in an evolutionary sense is that these relatively rare, uh, highly variable stars are uh, below this critical Rossby threshold where the magnetic transition seems to take place. Uh, at some point to the left of the peak, 
you're comparable to that critical Rossby number. And then over here, where, uh, comparable to the, the noisy sun histogram, you're well beyond the critical Rossby number where uh, rotation and activity decouple. So, uh, so we believe that this is actually a, an evolutionary effect and that if you could uh, define a sample of solar type stars with properties that were close enough to the actual sun, uh, then this wide distribution would actually dis disappear and you would only see the stars that are actually similar to the sun. So I'll stop there and we can uh, get to the questions. Great, thank you so much, Travis and uh, Nick for both of those very exciting talks. Uh, I just want to uh, say that uh, Coffees is, uh, uh, as you can see, we are very interested in the solar stellar connections. That is one of our, our big science questions. If you are more in the stellar community and you are also interested in the solar uh, stellar connection and you would be interested in joining our group, please reach out to any of the, the co-hosts that you see here or any of our speakers and we can get you more information on how to get involved with Coffees. Uh, with that, uh, let's take uh, some time for questions. You can either put your question in chat or raise your hand in Zoom and we will call on you. No questions? Or it's lunchtime. <laughs> yeah, it could be that. Um, I also just want to let everyone know, so we are having a coffee's happy hour um, later today. And so if you come up with questions or if you're just more interested in picking our brains or finding out more about coffees or like the uh, solar stellar connection that we are trying to make, um, feel free to join us there and we can keep the conversation going. So if you don't- uh, I just want to ask uh, Travis whether the sun is in, the, in, is, uh, in a transition state or not. It is unclear from his uh, talk whether what he thinks about that. Yeah, I, th I think of the evidence that I've seen, the sun is in a transitional state um, that it has, it is already in the process of decoupling the evolution of rotation and magnetic activity. Yes. Do you have any sense of how long that time period lasts or does it vary? Uh, there are relatively few constraints on how long it lasts, uh, but it is stellar evolution timescales, so of order a billion years from beginning to end. Great. Uh, Sushant Mahajan has a question in the chat. Can you comment on how to constrain solar convection overturn timescales from observations? I don't know if either one of you wants to take a stab at that. Yeah, I, I would say um, the most promising way forward right now, um, and there, there are other, there's, who knows um, what, what the answer might be at the end, but if you can get a handle on uh, the, the, the typical spatial scale of the interior convection, um, because we know the interior convection in the sun is, is influenced by its rotation uh, to some degree, just by virtue of the fact that it has a differential rotation, uh, particularly one that's prograde at the equator and retrograde at the poles. And so it, my opinion is that the, the most promising way forward is to say, what is the, what does the spectrum of the convection look like? Um, or can you, can you see hints of, of the, the dominant spatial scale at the surface? And if you do, uh, for instance, if, you know, um, well, if you do, you can link that to what the, the typical overturning time must be because um, then it's the, the Coriolis force in tandem with that, that flow speed that's giving you that, that structure. Great, any other questions? Please raise your hand or post it in the chat. Uh, in the meantime, I am going to put a link to the Coffee's event page in the chat. If you are interested in joining our happy hour event, there is a link to that on the flyer. Uh, it will be held in Wander. So please take a look at that. Any other questions? Alfio, I know you popped up earlier. Did you have uh, something that you wanted to ask? It's okay. Uh, I think I will have to think a little bit more. 
on what uh, Travis has, uh, has uh, discussed. Uh, I'm not convinced about uh, this, this transition, but that's nice, let's say. <laughs> it's nice to have uh, different opinion and uh, we'll have more occasion to discuss this. Uh, and uh, you see, I, I believe in the Copernican principle. I am uh, strictly adhered to that. I think that uh, the sun is really a star which has nothing absolutely different from other stars that we do not live in a privileged uh, place and also in a privileged time. But that's, let's say, it's a more philosophical uh, point of view. I hope I, I can argue about that uh, more um, uh, on, uh, the, from the scientific point of view. So I would like also to thank Travis for his nice uh, presentation on that. Okay, Thanks, great. Alfio. Uh, I would just say in response that um, I also believe in the Copernican principle. Uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just to emphasize that this is an element of this transition if we understand it correctly, is an element of, of every star like the sun, uh, that the sun is not special in any way for going through this. This is just a revision of the story of stellar evolution that we didn't know about before, a detail. Thanks so much, uh, Alfio, for those comments and, and Travis. Uh, also, if, you, if anyone has any questions about coffees in general, I'm sure that Todd would uh, be happy to answer them. I will also note that uh, Nick posted a link to some of his very cool movies in the chat. So if you're interested in those, uh, please visit those. And I guess if we have no more questions, Todd, did you have any final words that you'd like to say before we uh, release everyone to the wild? Uh, no, not in particular, except, you know, if you are interested um, in following coffees, there's a coffees news uh, channel that we do email with and uh, we have a monthly seminar series and you're welcome to sign up for those too. Um, but if you're interested in getting involved, we'd love to have you join one of the teams and participate. So good to see you all. And if you want to contact, you know, any of the folks here, uh, that'd be great. Thank you so much. If everyone can just uh, join me in a round of applause for our speakers. I know we don't get to experience very many of those, but thank you so much, uh, speakers. Hopefully see you all this afternoon, evening. Yeah, I'm looking forward to trying Wander. <laughs> all right. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Have a great afternoon. Hope to see you tonight. Okay. Bye-bye.